Well, good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome all of you here. Uh, we're really, really pleased to have you uh, here to participate and share in the second annual Law and Freedom Conference hosted by the Canadian Constitution Foundation. Uh, some of you might be thinking, second, I could have sworn I've done this two, three, maybe this is my fourth time and, and you're just, you're not losing your minds. It's true that we've done conferences. We had done conferences in the past, um, but we took a break. Uh, there were a few years when we didn't hold a conference and then last year we took a chance and uh, resurrected our, our conference and held our Law and Freedom Conference last year and we were just wonderfully, um, I don't know if surprised is the best word, but we were really pleasantly um, delighted with the results of last year and a lot of that there are a lot of people in this room who were either speakers or participants or in some way helped uh, with last year's conference who are back so thank you very much to you and thank you very much to everyone else who's here for the first time um, we what can I say we we are here because um, the, the, CCF, the CCF is committed to actively defending the constitutional rights and freedoms of Canadians. And I've been quite honored to see how far a lot of people have come for this conference. And I think in some ways that speaks to the interest that people have in that kind of work. Now, you know, we, we want to empower every person in this country to control his or her destiny as a free and responsible member of society. And that's part of our vision statement as an organization. Um, we view our task as litigating, educating, and communicating to make that goal possible. So we're, our job is to hold governments accountable to the Constitution and making them applying laws, regulations, and policies. But in, on, on a practical basis, what does that actually mean? Um, Everyone in this room probably has different ideas about how those rights are actually defined, what those rights and freedoms, how they should be interpreted, um, what judges have said about them, what judges should be saying about them. And that's all the, the, the sort of fun stuff that we're going to be getting, getting to over the next couple of days. Um, we, we are here because we are people who care about discussing this, debating it, thinking about it, asking questions. And I know that we all share one goal, which is the fulfillment of law's potential to actually honor and protect human freedom. And in some ways, all the rest of it are the details, and the details are gonna be fun to work and hash out. Um, but I do think that that one common core thing brings us together. So I hope that you'll be prepared for the weekend to be, I expect you to be challenged, surprised, and inspired were the words <laughs> that I wrote in my notes. Um, maybe at least one out of three would be good. Um, I think it should be a really good time. We have an excellent roster of speakers, really great, um, really great diversity of topics. Um, Kara, what you were on the original conference calls that we last year when we were talking about this conference, and one of the things we talked about was having a theme. Um, and we ultimately decided not to have a theme because we wanted to be able to choose just sort of the juiciest, most interesting things that were going on in terms of law and its impact on human freedom each year. And I really think that our uh, roster this year does exactly that. Um, and the next thing, I'm going to very soon hand it over to Asher Honigman. Um, Asher is a civil litigator and he is a great friend to CCF. He is also the president of Advocates for the Rule of Law, uh, which is a, a legal think tank. And Asher um, has been really wonderful in partnering with CCF on another project that we'll tell you a little bit more about tomorrow. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shortly call him up to, to introduce our, our speaker. But before I do that, let me just say one more time, it's very, very, really, I'm honored to have all of you here. It's a pleasure to have you here, and thank you so much for, for choosing to spend your weekend with us. And now I'd like to call up uh, Asher and Justice Stratus, please. Thank you, Marnie. I'm a great, very grateful to have the distinct privilege of introducing this year's keynote speaker, Justice David Stratus. Now, for those of you who don't know, Justice Stratus has served on the Federal Court of Appeal since 2009, and he's also served on the Court Martial Appeal Court of Canada since 2012. Prior to being appointed, Justice Stratus had a long and distinguished career as a litigator. He specialized in constitutional and administrative law. He was consistently recognized by his peers as being one of the best lawyers in Canada. He was known across the bar for his legal brilliance, prolific pu publishing, and tremendous work ethic. 
He received numerous honors over the years, along with an honorary doctor of laws from his alma mater, Queen's University, in 2012. In August 2015, Canadian Lawyer Magazine named Justice Stratus one of the top 25 most influential players in Canadian law. This was based on a survey of over 9,000 people. Now, Justice Stratus, he was a lawyer's lawyer, and he has since become a judge's judge. His decisions are invariably well-reasoned, and he is the judge who is delving deep into the doctrine to bring certainty and predictability to our laws. Uh, his writing style marries passion with precision, and maybe most important, his decisions are always interesting to read. Now, Justice Stratus has approached judging with humility and the utmost integrity. His reasoning is always objective and principled. He's spoken publicly about the problems inherent in judicial policy making, especially under Section 1 of the Charter. And he has consistently shown due regard for our nation's elected representatives. Uh, in one case, and I won't get into all the details, there was an issue about whether or not Parliament's understanding of the Constitution was relevant, whether there should be, a, in other words, a presumption of constitutionality. And Justice Stratus said that while judges must be the final arbiters of constitutional issues, quote, we must recognize that these other branches of government do try as they must to keep their actions and practices within the limits and powers given to them under the Constitution. This involves making judgments implicitly or explicitly regarding the limits of the Constitution. Other branches of government are interpreters of the Constitution. Justice Stratus went on to add that while Parliament's understanding of the Constitution may not warrant deference, quote, it would be arrogant for us to ignore others' constitutional interpretations as manifested in their practices and actions. What an important affirmation from the bench, and especially from one of Canada's top jurists. Now, I personally am fortunate to have studied under Justice Stratus when he was an adjunct professor at Queen's Law, and I can say now with this perspective of some years, and there's no brown nosing here because the marks are already in. <laughs> his, his course was without a doubt the most memorable academic experience I had at Queen's. Social experience is different, but definitely <laughs> academic experience, definitely. Uh, the, the level of discourse was unlike anything I'd ever been part of before. And, uh, but what really impressed me was that here's a guy who's one of the busiest lawyers in the country, and we all knew that, but he's traveling to and from Toronto and Kingston every single week to discuss constitutional law with a bunch of 20-somethings. And, and really take in what we're saying, too. And not only that, but taking the time outside of class to go over course material and even to talk about our lofty career goals. And Justice Stratus has brought that generosity of spirit to this conference. He's graciously offered to have a, a special session at breakfast tomorrow with the students. And my advice to any of the students out there is make sure you attend. Rarely will you have an opportunity to hang out with a judge who can quote verbatim not only from case law, but from entire episodes of South Park and, <laughs> and Star Trek. If that's not versatility, I don't know what is. So without further ado, it's my great honor to introduce Justice David Stratus. Well, thanks very much, Asher. That's uh, far too generous, and I'm really quite touched. It's a real privilege to be able to speak at a conference on this topic and to be part of an array of such high-caliber speakers this weekend. Law, freedom, and the Constitution are topics at the heart of our democracy, and they need to be examined from many different vantage points. And look at what's on offer this weekend all in a nonpartisan, neutral, stimulating setting. Civil forfeiture, the contemporary role of patents, health care, interprovincial trade, the Cotter case, disruptive technologies, and indigenous property rights. Now to my keynote address entitled Reflections on the Decline of Legal Doctrine. 
You know, I could give two kinds of talks here. One is where I mutter platitudes and try to be as beige as possible, and you all try to stifle yawns, and we all fall asleep together. The other is where I try to stimulate a little bit of thought, discussion, and debate, and who knows, maybe even a bit of reflection. Although I've had a long day, I really don't need that much sleep right now, and so I'd rather do talk number two. But to do that, I just need to make a couple of things clear. As some will know, in the courtroom, I must consider what people say very, very carefully before I make real life decisions. So nothing I say tonight should be taken as a settled view on anything. As a judge, I am open-minded and dedicated in every case I hear and decide it correctly, at least I try to, based on legal views. These legal views are often influenced by what counsel have said and by what they have told me to read, what I read myself, and by what my colleagues discuss with me. Nothing tonight should be taken as undercutting the essential open-mindedness and neutrality that I am obligated to bring to every case that comes before me. Another opening point, during my remarks, I do comment on cases tonight. Please bear in mind that although I might offer some critical views about the reasoning in some cases, this does not mean that I necessarily disagree with the result they reached. In any event, my views on the results of cases, at least those decided by the Supreme Court of Canada, are moot. I am bound to follow what they say, regardless of my personal views. And one last opening point. People tend to listen to things and apply labels to the speaker. I know, I sometimes do it myself. So people say that obviously so-and-so is a liberal or so-and-so is a conservative or so-and-so is a libertarian or so-and-so is a collectivist. Tonight I'm giving a talk that defies these labels. Everything I've ever written as a judge is online. If you really need some sleep, go there and read. But if you actually were to read and stay awake, you'll discover that only one label fits me. I am pro-legality. Whether the law is liberal, conservative, libertarian, collectivist, or whatever, if the law was passed by one of our legislators, subject to constitutional objection, I enforce it according to its terms and purposes using legal methodologies. Now, finally, to my talk. We'd like to think that law, freedom, and the Constitution in our country are permanent things. That is because we live in the world of today where, by and large, we substantially have these things. But that is facile. We live in four dimensions, one of which is time. What we have today is what we have today, but time marches on and circumstances can change. In 1930, who would have thought that within 10 years, millions of Jews would be wiped from the face of the planet just because they are Jews? Is that too extreme an example? Okay. In 1930, who would have thought that within 10 years, thousands of Japanese in North America would have their property confiscated and be forcibly exiled into internment camps? Is that too long ago for you? Okay. In 1960, who would have thought that within 10 years, hundreds of our fellow citizens would be plucked off the streets of Quebec and thrown into jail without charge, without hearing, without anything other than the merest suspicion? Some of you tonight can perhaps raise other things, some things that are more contemporary. I have to stay away from contemporary political things. But I think you now have my point. Just because you might think right now that we live in relatively benign times does not mean that that will continue. If history tells us anything, it just might not. So now, with that in mind, I want to invite you to join me in a little thought experiment. Imagine the most controversial case possible about 30 years from now. I don't know, let's suppose that 30 years from now, 
there's a serious national emergency of some sort, something that strikes most severely at our safety and security. The government passes laws that it and many others say are necessary. Bans of speech, arbitrary arrest, detention of suspects, the denial of voting rights to some, the confiscation of certain people's property, wholesale invasion of, of certain people's privacy, the suspension of parliamentary sittings, what have you. Go wild. Think radical. The issue of the government's compelling interest to do these things versus all of these rights, liberties, and freedoms suddenly explodes into a courtroom 30 years from now before a judge. Do you want that judge deciding the issue on the basis of a body of constitutional and administrative law or public law cases based on fundamental principles consistently applied over decades? In other words, do you want that judge to decide on the basis of settled legal doctrine or on the basis of responsible incremental extension of legal doctrine? Do you want that judge to reach a decision following pathways of objective legal reasoning practiced by judges for decades, if not centuries? Or 30 years from now, do you want that judge deciding the issue based on her or his own world views, his or her own idiosyncratic thoughts of the moment, her or his own freestanding opinions at that time about what is appropriate and right, his or her own personal sense of what in the circumstances is fair? and nice? Which approach is more likely to garner the respect of the populace? What approach is more likely to result in a court order that will be obeyed? Most of all, during times of disorder, violence, and fear, what approach is more likely to promote order, civility, and calm? To me, the answer is obvious. We need judges to act on the basis of settled legal doctrine or the responsible incremental extension of that doctrine achieved through time-honored pathways of objective legal reasoning practiced by judges for decades, if not centuries. If you're with me so far, then now I want to take you one step further. If we want judges down the road to act on the basis of settled doctrine. And if you agree with me that one day that might be really, really urgent, then logically we must today, right now, devote ourselves to settling public law doctrine in a comprehensive and proper way. And once it is settled, we need to be consistent about it for years and even decades. Getting around to this Tomorrow is simply too late. Is this too lofty an aspiration for public law? I think not. In the area of contract and commercial law, that has happened. The doctrine is largely settled. In that area, in the most contentious, most high stakes disputes, courts make the, their decisions for the most part based on doctrine that has been worked out settled and applied consistently for decades, if not centuries. The decisions come out. There might be a brief tittle among some, and people move on. Properly functioning bodies of law are comparatively boring, and hooray for that. Is that happening in the area of constitutional law and administrative law? a body of law that we collectively call public law, a body of law that we rely on to safeguard our law, freedom, and constitutional arrangements. I am worried that today this is not happening enough. In fact, I wonder whether some are even interested in that project. I am worried that within the legal community, judges, legal academics, and lawyers, 
public law cases are increasingly being dealt with in a manner that appears non-doctrinal or that is non-doctrinal. Today, as I shall demonstrate with a couple of examples, not enough attention is being paid to the development of doctrine with a view to settling it once and for all so that it can be applied consistently. This approach has knock-on effects. We are starting to see newspaper stories that present public law cases as political events, the product of individualized policy judgments and political views authored by judges who are, according to some journalists, expected to voice the views of the politicians who appointed them. In other words, more and more seem to be seeing judges as political servants and political actors. The more this continues, the more the legitimacy of judicial decision making will be called into question. In the end result, we will be woefully unprepared for the searingly controversial cases that will no doubt arise down the road. Let's look at just a few things today that judges, lawyers, and academics are doing. First, the judges. Now, I'm going to refer a bit to the Supreme Court of Canada here. I do so only because they are top of the heap and most visible. But the problems I describe are shared by lower courts, too. Public law cases need to be settled by judges based on firmly worked out doctrine that is consistently applied. Is that happening? Let's look at the charter guarantee of freedom of association. It is an essential freedom. It guarantees that we can meet at places like this and ex express ourselves, speak with each other, learn, and come away better. Nearly 35 years after freedom of association was made part of our constitutional law, this essential freedom should now be solid. But what has happened? Saskatchewan Federation of Labor in 2015 changed the doctrine in Meredith and MPAO in 2015, which changed the doctrine in Fraser in 2011, which changed health services in 2007, which changed Dunmore and advanced cutting and coring in 2001, which changed Delisle in 1999, which changed Reference Republic Public Service Employee Relations Act, PSAC, and Saskatchewan Dairy Workers in 1987. <sighs> it took a while just to put the thread through all those cases, make sure I had them all. In 1987, the right of unions to strike and collectively bargain was statutory and was decided not to be constitutionally guaranteed. But today, we have the opposite result. Are you unhappy with this result? Who knows? Maybe with all this changing doctrine we've had in the past, things will change in the next couple of years to your liking. <laughs> all these cases were from the same institution, the Supreme Court of Canada. And the only thing that changed was the composition of the court. Let me take another case. In 1993, in Rodriguez, the Supreme Court said that a criminal prohibition against assisted suicide was constitutional. In 2015, in Carter, the Supreme Court said that the same criminal prohibition was unconstitutional. What exactly changed in such a fundamentally important area? In my view, not much. As is well known, under the Charter, legislation that infringes rights or freedoms can be saved under Section 1 if it is a reasonable limit justified in a free and democratic society. The only thing that had changed in 2015 in Carter under Section 1 was the trial judge's acceptance of evidence that the risk of abuse associated with assisted suicide could be controlled. The judge's, trial judge's finding was a constitutionally significant finding based on social science evidence. The Supreme Court in Carter said that it and appeal courts could not interfere with that. According to the Supreme Court, that new finding by the trial court judge, which it had to respect, justified the reversal of the 1993 case of Rodriguez. But the Supreme Court never really analyzed that evidence itself. Was the evidence so significant that a departure was warranted? 
The Supreme Court obviously thought so, but said little on this. It changed the doctrine, but never really told us why the doctrine should change. It just changed it. You know, until Carter, as a matter of doctrine, appeal courts could review constitutionally significant social science evidence. Look at what the Supreme Court did in Morgenthaler in 1988. The first instance judge found no evidence before him capable of establishing a security of the person interest under Section 7 of the Charter arising from Canada's restrictions on therapeutic abortion in the criminal code. The Supreme Court in Morgenthaler considered itself totally free to take a different view of the effect of the evidence before the trial judge and did so. And since then, in many, many cases, the Supreme Court has characterized constitutionally significant social science evidence in a way different from how first instance judges did it. But in Carter, that just changed. Very little was said why. And certainly the old doctrine in the old cases, and the old cases themselves, on this point, went unmentioned. Does this matter? Well, with this change, and assuming, and assuming the change stays in place, which could be a big assumption, the outcome of major constitutional cases will now very much depend on how a single judge at the bottom of the judicial heap happens to characterize constitutionally significant social science evidence. Is that sound doctrine? Well, again, no explanation rooted in rationale or doctrine was expressed in Carter. Ideally, a key holding such as that should be wedded, in my view, to the hard steel of the doctrine painstakingly worked out in previously decided cases. But for some reason, that was just not done here. Personally, I considered the old pre-Carter doctrine better rooted in our fundamental understandings of our legal system and the legal status of the Constitution as our supreme law. That old doctrine allowed the Supreme Court to interfere more readily with lower court holdings to ensure proper constitutional outcomes. I would have thought that nine of our best judges at the Supreme Court working together at the top of the judicial heap on a controversial constitutional case are more likely to get things right than one judge at the bottom, a person sometimes chosen through random happenstance. Some people commenting on Carter and the labor cases suggest that the cases are decided differently from earlier cases merely because the composition of the court has changed with new people bringing personal views. I express no comment on that, except to say that I really hope that is not the case. What I will say is that it's profoundly unfortunate that the appearance of things causes some people to think that way. It undercuts the legitimacy of judicial decision making, legitimacy, as I have said, that we may have to draw upon on some dark, really controversial day in the future. I could point to many more cases in all courts where doctrines are ignored or cases seem to be decided divorced from doctrine, but because of time, I want to say more about only one point, which is judges creating doctrine for the first time in cases where it has not been worked out. To me, the solution there is to get the doctrine right the first time and then have the courage to stick to it. Then it will never have to be uprooted or altered. That might mean that the first time the court encounters an area of new doctrine, it has to reserve its judgment for a very, very long time, over a year, perhaps longer. Some of the older lawyers in the room will recall the Supreme Court of the 1980s that had a first crack at the charter and settled so much. Almost to a person, they took great pains to define the content of charter provisions based on our historical, philosophical, and common law roots. They were painstaking in their desire to cite everything possible in these areas, both for and against the ultimate interpretation of the charter provision they reached. The analysis was not tendentious. It was scholarly and balanced. I invite you to read those cases. They somehow seem different. In my view, the lack of attention to doctrine has been with us for a while now. 
Recently, Justice Rothstein, just before he released his last decision from the Supreme Court of Canada, highlighted this sort of problem. In a public speech, he expressed worry about the misuse of the living tree metaphor in Canadian constitutional law, a metaphor that, as many of you know, has been used by judges and lawyers in public law cases for 90 years. For those of you here who are non-lawyers, the metaphor is that the constitutional is that constitutional provisions be interpreted liberally like a, quote, living tree capable of growth and expansion within its natural limits, end quote. This comes to us from the famous words of Lord Sankey in the 1925 case of Edwards. Justice Rothstein noted, in my view correctly, that too many judges leap to the living tree metaphor almost as a shortcut and adopt the most expansive views possible of the interpretation of charter provisions, rather than seriously considering their real historical, philosophical, and common law roots. In other words, they fasten onto an ideological talisman rather than doing the hard work of doctrinal analysis. And interestingly, that doctrinal analysis might well have taken them where the living tree would take them, but they have not investigated. Justice Rothstein noted, in my view aptly and accurately, that Edwards concerned a politically significant issue, whether women could serve in the Senate of Canada, but employed a distinctly non-political doctrinal approach. In his words, it was, quote, garden variety statutory interpretation analytical approach, end quote. Have you read Edwards recently? It's boring, actually. In other words, the doctrine that some call dull. I'm a geek, I love it. But some think it dull. The doctrine, not freestanding policy views, resolve the issue. The Supreme Court has instructed us from the beginning to employ a purposive approach to the interpretation of charter provisions. I happen to agree with that. But this does not necessarily mean charter provisions must grow like a living tree as far as they can possibly grow. My point is just that under a proper purposive approach, you cannot, access pur uh, you cannot analyze purpose without examining the foundation of the right or freedom and its entire historical, philosophical, and common law roots. In other words, you cannot do it without following the methodology that many of those judges in the 80s did. In my view, if the purpose of analysis is done exhaustively, properly, and correctly for the first time, it need never be revisited and changed wholesale in the future. Purposes behind a fundamental right or freedom do not shift or change within a decade or two. We as judges need to think this way just a little bit more often. The other area of public law I want to discuss ever so briefly is administrative law. At the center of our democracy is the separation of powers, the demarcation of authority among legislators, the executive, and the judiciary, checking each other's powers. Administrative law is the body of law that governs the relationship between the judiciary and their duty to enforce the rule of law on the one hand, and on the other hand, the executive's power to carry out legislative mandates. In short, administrative law supplies the rules that lie very much at the heart of our democracy. The rules are all important. If the balance is skewed too far in one direction or the other, our democracy suffers. An unduly meek judiciary gives the executive a free pass to ride roughshod over time-honored rights, such as decision-making based on facts and logic, the application of standards of legality and conduct in accordance with procedural fairness. On the other hand, an overactive judiciary trenches, trenches on the ability of the executive to act in accordance with the wishes of the elected government. At either extreme, if judges are overly meek or overly active, our democracy suffers. In the tension between the judiciary and the executive, the judiciary is the final word. When a dispute arises, the judiciary must decide. Should judges resolve the executive-judiciary tension with ad hoc 
make it up on the fly policy or personal views? In my view, no. If it is acting properly, courts have to resolve the executive judiciary tension with neutral legal formulations, objective tests, or preset logical analytical frameworks to resolve the tension. What are the legal formulations, tests, or analytical frameworks to resolve that tension? Well, they're all bound up in a body of law or doctrine we call the standard of review. We must also remember that the doctrine has to be clear and practical enough to be usable in the courtroom. Counsel need to be able to understand it, to explain it to their clients, to be able to make submissions to the court, to view the reasons for judgment and see the doctrine reflected in it, reflected consistently. So in light of those comments, what does our law of judicial review look like? Sadly, the Canadian law of judicial review has been a never-ending construction site where one crew builds structures and a later crew tears them down to build new structures seemingly without an overall plan. Roughly 40 years ago, the Supreme Court told us to categorize decisions as judicial, quasi-judicial, or administrative. Some of you might remember Matsqui Institution. Then largely comprised of different members, the court told us to follow a pragmatic and functional test. That was Bebo. Then with further changes in its composition, the court added another category of review Reasonableness, to join patent unreasonableness and correctness, that was Southam. Then, with some more new judges, it told us to follow the principles and methodology in Dunsmuir and New Brunswick. Now it appears we may be on the brink of more change. The Supreme Court, mysteriously, is not deciding cases in accordance with the principles in Dunsmuir and other cases decided under Dunsmuir. The cases conflict. Now, it's not just me saying it. In the most recent judicial review case, Canthasmi, two Supreme Court judges wrote separately, worrying quite openly that the Supreme Court is now deciding cases in a manner contrary to what it actually says in the case law. And another judge in a slightly earlier case, CBC and Sondrak, said something to similar effect in dissent. That's three of nine judges who say this quite openly. In other words, either there is no real doctrine at the root of these cases, or the doctrine is just not being followed. If you think about the need for settled, trusted, do trusted doctrine and the controversial cases that might come in the future, these are chilling words. I could say so much more about public law decisions of courts at all levels, about how cases are conflicting because they seem to be decided on the basis of ad hoc impressions based on fact rather than settled principle, and how few judges these days seem interested in developing legal doctrine. But time is short. Let's turn to lawyers. We judges rely on lawyers. Do lawyers argue their cases on the basis of doctrine? Not many. I'm sad to say that very few read the cases, let alone understand the doctrine. Perhaps time's too short, given all the marketing that law firms seem to require of senior lawyers these days. Last year, in a really important case in, in my court, a lawyer argued that an administrative law decision was unreasonable in the administrative law sense. As many of you know, this is a concept that has plenty of stated doctrine surrounding it. Did he rely on that doctrine? No. I asked him what he was basing his submissions on reasonableness on. This is in court, an important case. His authority was his spouse. <laughs> Over the breakfast table, he explained to her what the tribunal did, and she exclaimed, that's unreasonable. <laughs> in another really important case, in an appeal on a judicial review, I asked the appellant's lawyer what sort of margin of appreciation we should give to an administrative tribunal 
In other words, how much deference we should give it. Her response, I don't do administrative law. I thought that was bad, but the other side, the lawyer on the other side, I asked the exact same question, and I got the answer, I don't do administrative law. Very rarely does a lawyer come before us who is familiar with nuances of the doctrine and pulls the right levers in trying to convince us that a decision is reasonable or unreasonable. When that happens, we really notice, because it is really quite rare. Now to the legal academy. Too often cases are analyzed for the political outcomes they reach, not the doctrine used to get there. And remarkably few articles are written about what the legal doctrine should be or how cases have handled or not handled the legal doctrine. My challenge to the legally trained people in this room is to take any recent Supreme Court case and look for academic literature. Go to um, Canley, and there's the new feature, Canley Connect, which gives you lots of stuff that's been written. More than half the time, you see a clear thumbs up or thumbs down based on the political or ideological desirability of the outcome reached, but not the doctrine followed. Essentially, an open line radio show comment put in an educated way with high flute and legal language. There are some wonderful exceptions out there. For example, the writings of legendary law professors, those of the old school, which ought to be the contemporary school, like Professor David Mullen, and the commentary in blogs by Professor Paul Daly and Leonard Sirota. These folks talk about the cases and the doctrines, but not enough through the academy is being done. And increasingly, law schools are neglecting administrative law and teaching constitutional law like a theory class rather than stressing the doctrine. There are now seven law schools in this country where administrative law is taught by adjunct or temporary faculty, not associate or full professors. That is not right. As for students, I interview many of Canada's very best law students for law clerk positions every year. For many, when I raise public law with them, I'm struck how often Many other students apparently top notch start articulating the issues in political terms, not legal terms. Too often students are taught administrative law theory rather than grappling with doctrine and what courts and elsewhere are actually doing. One student with an A in administrative law on his transcript recently told me that administrative law is about philosophy and political theory and there can never be clear principles. He knew only about five administrative law cases, and he got an A. Another student recently told me that in his administrative law class, he was thrown into an ocean of case law with no doctrinal map to navigate his way. If these are the academics, lawyers, and judges of our future, I fear for our future. Let me end on a positive note. There actually is a positive note. Sometimes we have to hear the worst to develop the will to galvanize ourselves and make it better. Every once in a while there are academic students, lawyers and judges who really care about the doctrine that we need developed in order to safeguard our future freedoms in our constitution. There are some who really deeply care Let's give them more company. Let's increase the numbers. Let's rededicate our law faculties, legal profession, and judiciary to the pursuit of legal doctrine, and let's insist, insist that judges develop doctrine and be consistent in applying it. My personal ambition in 2016 is to do more calling out on this, as unpleasant as that may be for me in the short run, and you will be seeing more of me doing that soon. And let's see more great law conferences like this. I congratulate the Canadian Constitutional Foundation and all of the organizers, speakers, and participants. In the area of doctrine, let's work hard to make things better, because we can. 
Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be pleased now to receive comments and suggestions. Thank you. Justice Stratus, I have to thank you. Uh, I didn't even know judges felt this way. Yeah. Too many times I've been in front of a judge where I know the law and I'm um, uh, somewhat taken aback at the fact that the judge either doesn't know it or doesn't care about it. And my question to you is, would you have any suggestions on what might be the best way to respond to a judge when you're in that situation? You just have to do the best you can. Uh, for a judge who seems less than fully prepared or less than knowledgeable, I think as an advocate you have to go to plan B and like a law professor, uh, briefly and efficiently acquaint him or her with the basics of the point that, that you're trying to develop. When, when I was a litigation lawyer, I would encounter that all the time. And it was necessary to junk the planned approach and do things at a far more fundamental level. The interesting thing is, um, you know, there are very strict time limits and, and they want to move through cases quickly, but actually if you do that properly and you start to acquaint them with the, 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 the basic information and knowledge they need, they will often be patient and, and grant more time, but you have to be really brief Quick follow and do up. it well. If, if I'm trying that and yet I find that I'm encountering some, um, put it politely, resistance, at what point do I stop gilding the lily? Oh, I think you, you, you keep calm, you be the professional that you are, and you say in the back of your head that today's really frustrating losses are tomorrow's victories in the Court of Appeal. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one court where you can't say that. And my record in the Supreme Court of Canada when I was an advocate was 2 and 11. So I know what that feels like. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Uh, to somebody who's not a lawyer, could you explain what you mean by the difference between theory and doctrine? Yeah. Uh, theory, uh, I apologize, actually. My choice of words uh, leads directly to, to that question. By theory, I mean deep philosophical questions about, let's take the law of contracts, for example on what assumptions or philosophical bases should we base a law of contract. Now, the truth is that we have adopted, for the most part, a theory of contract. It's often known as the Harvard theory of contract. One can critique it in law school it's important to critique it in law school so that one has an intelligent understanding of why the rules that emanate from it cause unfairness. The problem is that some contract courses spend all their time on that when there's a plethora of important contemporary issues sitting there in the decided cases that require attention and thought. It's really... Um, a question of emphasis, and in many law schools now, much is being said, too much is being said in areas that actually do not equip our students well to participate in the activity of serving their clients and furthering doctrine. I hope that helps. Justice Stratus, thank you for that. I'm one of those legal academics who may be contributing to the unraveling of doctrine. I hope I'm not too often, at least, but uh, I wanted only to quibble with the idea that we shouldn't, or we should confuse Canley Connects with academic legal writing I all hear the time, you. but I really, I'm just being cute. Really, I want to ask, what do you see as the, ro as the proper way for the courts to use academic writing as they uh, interpret and use and develop legal doctrine? Yeah, uh, heavily so, heavily so. Uh, if you look at my work, I use it quite regularly, whether cited to me or not. Typically what will happen is I will have done the preparation in advance and raised thoughts and ideas 
that I find attractive to counsel in the courtroom to get their views on it. So there's no problem with, you know, unfairness and sort of surprising them with things. But you see, my job as a judge is to decide cases on the fact and the law. As a judge, when I look at the law, I'm not shackled to the law I'm given in a courtroom, and you wouldn't want that to happen. Judges and courts cannot be shackled to the most skilled lawyer in the courtroom, who's sometimes not all that knowledgeable of the law. That happens. Our job is to know the law. Not just know it, but think about it. Think about the doctrines that inform how we use the rules, and then use the rules intelligently against the facts of the case uh, in a way that's consistent with what the people full time in the academic community are looking at this all the time in a way that they would applaud. Uh, do most judges feel this way? Um, I think not. Um, let me digress for a moment and, and give a couple of reflections on judges. Good courts have judges of all types. Like a good workshop, there should be many different tools in the workshop. And the best panels that I've sat on, frankly, are where the judges' skills don't duplicate. They supplement each other. But basically, as I see it, you have some judges that are uh, extremely practical by virtue of life experience or disposition. And some are result-oriented. They have a sense based on their experience of where a case ought to go. There's another category of judges that are very rule-based. Uh, they venerate legal rules, so they'll want to know the ratio of a Supreme Court decision and then apply it. Uh, they're, they're quite uh, uh, concrete in the way they look at law. Then um, there are people that are doctrinal, that understand the rules, but they want to know more about how to use them. And, uh, th these are perhaps reformist people that might want to tweak or modify the rules. Um, I'm in that category, admittedly, uh, as you may have sur surmised. Uh, but let me put in a sales point for that approach. When I look at the judiciary and the judges of that disposition who regularly go to the academic literature to train themselves, inform themselves, and guide them in cases. I'm talking about great judges like Bob Sharp, Jim McPherson, uh, uh, Catherine Swinton. These are folks, uh, John Evans, now retired from my court. These are folks who were actually law school academics and moved to the judiciary. Uh, it's hard to think of many legal academics who went to the judiciary that have done a bad job. Most have excelled. I'd love to see more, frankly. I just had a question about uh, the length of cases. Uh, over the past hundred years or so, legal cases, the, the decisions have become longer and longer. And I was wondering if you saw a relationship between um, the, the amount of, let's say, dicta, over dicta, non-holding rules, not like that, not actually what was used to decide the case, um, and the what you see as uh, uh, diminution of doctrine and, then, and, and less doctrine. Do you, do you see that um, judges are writing more um, in terms of their thoughts and politics and, and, and that's how they're, they're, they're trying to drive up force, emotional force to their argument? It, 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 do you see a relationship there or, or am I getting that backwards perhaps? Well, uh, I think um, uh, I have no view on that. I haven't really thought about it. Uh, I haven't thought about that relationship. We'd be in the realm of speculation, it seems to me, though perhaps somebody will, will study it someday from an academic standpoint. Um, I know this, that some of the best jurisprudence out there says a lot in very few pages. Uh, I know, critiquing my own work, my longer pieces that don't do that are cases where perhaps I didn't think it through and refine it as much as I should have. I find that the tightest, most compelling work is the work where you've really thought and reflected over something. 
So you have, you have a sense of what is relevant and what is not, and you have the courage to leave the extraneous stuff on a cutting room floor. When Marnie uh, uh, said to us at the board of CCF, uh, I said, this is our keynote speaker, and she was so excited. And I thought, well, that's interesting. <laughs> another judge, clearly not just another judge. Uh, I also want to say, uh, having worked your way through the judges and the litigators and the academics, I've never been so glad to have been a solicitor all my career, uh, <laughs> carrying no fault or blame through this the process. As I, and not being a litigator, I listened carefully to the tone and content of your talk, and I wondered, is it as simple as a lack of, of discipline and effort? As I listened to some of your comments about how judges have approached these, as you drew the threads through some of the litigation chain or case chains that you uh, so so cogently outlined, as you talked about listening to lawyers who were presenting at the bar and, and presenting to you and others. As I listened to and thought of my own experience with academics, I thought, you know, the common thread here is a lack of hard work, a lack of, I'm going to put the thought time, the elbow grease into this. I'm going to carefully read, reread the cases, understand the history of the decisions, understand the history behind the points that are being made. That's just hard work. And you've framed it as a, a lack of doctrinal settlement. I wonder if it's simply a lack of intellectual effort uh, running through the piece. Now, as a solicitor, I have seen that and have experienced that. So we, as solicitors, um, have, have the same problem. It's the lack of hard work the late nights, the plucking your sheets, where is this going? Yeah. Could you comment? Uh, sure. I'm going to be careful only because I don't really know what the cause is. I would be just speculating. Uh, my purpose today is simply to point out the problem and, and to urge the solution. Mm -hmm. Somehow I think that if the problem were talked about openly, uh, people, I would think, would engage in self-examination uh, and see how they might improve a standard. I think the very best people in every profession are like students eager to learn and always willing to approve. The best people are actually people that know how to point a finger, but they recognize that whenever they point a finger, there's three fingers pointing backward. I can tell you frankly that in preparing and thinking about this speech, I did a lot of self-reflection about whether I'm doing my best to not be part of the problem uh, that I'm setting out. I think all professionals, not just judges, lawyers, doctors, architects, accountants, Part of the meaning of a professional is actually to reflect on whether you're giving the public the skills uh, and the effort that they deserve. You talked about um, the desirability of not uh, having the judge interpret things based on their own personal sense yeah. of right and wrong, and I think yeah. no one would disagree with that. Uh, I'm a commercial lawyer, so I'm not a real lawyer, right. but <laughs> even I know that you know, sometimes, yes, the law is crystal clear, but often it's not. And the, the judgment that you bring to the case and the way you interpret the facts and you think about the law can't help but be informed by your worldview. And I'm just wondering if you could say a bit about yeah. a, a, how much of oneself a judge can bring to a case and what you do when you catch yourself doing that. See, I'm kind of skeptical that personal views come into it. Uh, as much as people think. You know, in the problem you set out, there's two different lines of case law. And let's say they conflict. I mean, I think the proper thing for a judge to do is further research, go behind those lines of case law, try to discern what philosophy or doctrine lies behind the words that have been put on the page, and then assess at first of all, at that level, 
which makes more sense given contemporary society. Now, that's not a political view of, you know, I hate employers, so I'm going to rule in favor of the union. Uh, or that's not a sense of uh, goodness, Acme Co, multinational making far too much money, I don't like that. Uh, rather, it's more of an investigation into the roots of the doctrine to reconcile and decide which is best. I think added to it is one has to have an awareness of judicial policies that have been properly developed that need to be applied. Let me give an example. In a very good decision, the Supreme Court in RINIAC, which many will be aware of, uh, stress to all in the litigation community the need for simplicity, fewer pointless procedures, faster results, and greater access to justice. That's now a judicial policy. That's not just a political have your say thing. That's a point of view that has emerged against the template of observing zillions of cases that have gone through the system and what's best to make them work better. That's now a judicial policy that has to be applied. So for example, in reconciling case law, one might say, does rule A or rule B, will it achieve not just good results on the cases, but will it do so more simply, faster? Will it be easier to articulate? Or to put it negatively, will a rule, as opposed to another rule, create more debating points? more points of dispute between parties that have to decide it, and thus more pointless motions, and more delay, and more expense. These are the th sort of things that have to be considered. But it's not, I feel sorry for plaintiff X, and I'm going to bend and twist to help plaintiff X, or I have a certain orientation about the economy, and so I'm going to give voice to it. That's what I'm decrying. Hello, sir. Hello. Um, I am a law student in Australia right now. Wonderful. And, yes. And I, I, I promise you, I will be one of the key advocates that promotes the continuation of and up, upholdance of the doctrine. I find the Australians in, are very good at it. They well, are, and and, yes. and that was that was going to be my point. Um, Sorry. I. I <laughs> Well, they, they, really, they really are. They've yes. gotten this right. And even the configuration of the law school that I go to, I go to Bond. At first, you know, it has, you know, uh, connotations that you go to Bond. But I find that they, they, they relish it. And I've learned so much from that. And um, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful for that. And, and I, I, I will. I just, I just hope that, I hope, I hope that I can be a in this uh, and and um, perpetuate it. And I did have another point here, and I can't remember what my point well, was. I, I congratulate you. Work hard, study hard. Yes. Not just know the rules, but know what lies behind them well, and learn how exactly. to manipulate them and use them uh, skillfully, and you'll go far. The, you know, just as you think about your other point, um, the Australians do doctrine well, but you know, they run afoul of one thing. What's that? Well, there's a great debate, and you see it in American legal literature, between people that think that human conduct should be regulated by very precise, multifaceted rules, and others who think we shouldn't overdefine things and build tests, but rather just define concepts and trust the judges to apply concepts. Mm -hmm. um, count me as more of a standards person. Let me explain. You know, in negligence law, there's judges sometimes have to de decide whether a person's conduct, a defendant's conduct, was just a mere innocent error of judgment, or did it fall below a standard of care? Mm -hmm. Now, the beauty of the common law is you go through the cases, and the concepts emerge from a reading of the case law. There's no tenfold practical, pragmatic, and functional test or something to decide that. The beauty of letting concepts some through the common law speak for themselves is that 
it creates fewer debating points. Once you define multifaceted tests, as the Australians are very much addicted to, if I could generalize, then you get mountains of case law not directly oriented at the concept, but rather about whether um, the word uh, X in branch number two means W or Z. And the litigation breaks out and it goes to the top of the <coughs> chain and it's decided and then the next little debating point er mm -hmm. erupts. I think in this day and age of uh, the need to increase access, curtail expense, uh, and reduce delay, we need to think more about leaving certain things undefined. Like in administrative law, I'm a huge fan that we give up the idea of having multifaceted tests and instead just talk about margins of appreciation, the level of deference, the way a, a judge might talk about standard of care. So what is your opinion of the fact that they don't have a charter of rights and it is mostly implied? They may want one in the face <laughs> of a non-benign government. Mm -hmm. uh, no question they have uh, develop the common law to provide protections. It's interesting that although they do not have a charter of rights, they have striven, sometimes very imaginatively, mm. to find implied yes. rights, like an implied freedom of expression arising from their division of powers arrangements. Mm -hmm. And association from political communications. Exactly. Yeah. I find that um, imaginative. Creative, quite. Yes. Okay. But, Think. you know, every society has to define for itself what its fundamental arrangements are, so in the end it's for them to decide. Thanks, Justice Stratus. Um, I just want to pick up on a point that you made that I found fascinating about um, the prevalence of adjunct professors and things yes. like that at law faculties. And I have two questions. The first is the second phenomenon, as I'm sure you're aware, is currently um, there's been a number of new faculty hires at Toronto and Osgood where the faculty actually have PhDs in other topics, in philosophy, yes. for example. That's a sort of popular route. Um, and so my question is, first of all, if you see some type of parasitic relationship between, on the one hand, um, jurisprudence becoming sort of haphazard and lots of inconsistent outcomes and seemingly um, sort of quixotic decisions, and so hewing in the academy to theory because it's more predictable, it's seemingly more rigorous, so just to, to consider. And then I guess the more important question that we'd all like to hear from you on is what do you see to be ideally the job of the law professor or the legal educator? I bemoan uh, too much interdisciplinary work. Law is complicated enough as a separate field of study uh, the interdisciplinary work can shed light on things. Uh, one would be an idiot to discount what, for instance, the law and economics movement at the, at the University of Chicago has, has done uh, for our increased understanding of, of how legal rules work and, in some cases, how they ought to be formulated and the societal effects that the legal rules uh, cause. To me, it's a question of balance. My complaint is it's way out of balance right now. Mm -hmm. To me, the ideal academic, and I, I don't want to mention names, though some of you may be able to guess who I'm thinking of, but the ideal legal academ academic is aware of many other disciplines, but concentrates on law, concentrates on the decided cases, does a community service by commenting on those cases promptly in a, in a very helpful, erudite way, but at the same time mixes in appreciations gleaned, which an academic can only have through, through years of work uh, and 100% commitment within academic pursuit, uh, you know, to, to, to share insights on a field. Um, there's a couple that I definitely have in mind. Who are those people? Look at who the judges are citing repeatedly, uh, and that will tell you a lot. My question is, to what extent is this um, lack of respect or 
as I might say, um, for decided cases and precedent and, and old stuff yeah. in the legal uh, community, is it caused by a perception, fair or unfair, that's, that judges have historically, and the legal institutions have historically ignored uh, the viewpoints of disadvantaged groups or marginalized groups in society? Well, uh, if that's so, and if that's a reason to ignore a pronouncement in a case, let's see the reasoning. Uh, I'm somewhat perplexed by a recent Supreme Court of Canada case called Canthazomy, where I believe it's in paragraph 49, the Supreme Court tells us that jurisprudence decided before a case called Dunsmuir in 2008 should be disregarded. And then in the same paragraph, actually starts citing pre Dunsmuir cases. And there's no reason expressed. So what are we to make of it? You know, old cases are still good law until they're set aside. And if they're going to be set aside, then let's be up front and explain why the doctrine is no longer suitable for modern Canadian society. You know, I, uh, funny thing about old cases, they form part of the doctrine too. Last time I saw uh, an old case, I didn't see any line that says best before at the beginning. <laughs> They're still on the books. So in one case called Paradise Honey, I cited two Supreme Court of Canada cases. One was a uh, uh, hundred years ago and the other one was slightly over a hundred years ago, I believe. And it's funny, the commentaries you get, what, what are these cases and why is he citing them? Well, they're Supreme Court of Canada cases and they bind me. And they actually spoke directly to the facts of that particular case, so they were quite relevant. We have to, I think, get away from labeling. So, old case, bad. Well, not necessarily. Uh, some still remain good law. Those that are suspect, we need to actually read closely, discern what they're driving at, and then ask, are those ideas consistent with modern judicial philosophy, or, most importantly, uh, legislative initiatives that bind us? Last chance. <laughs> no, those are some great questions. Justice Stratus, thank you so much for, um, for that talk. Andy is absolutely right that when I talked to the board about your having accepted the invitation, I was very excited. And Andy's also right that um, in some ways it was hard to explain because people hear about a sitting judge speaking and expect that they're going to give more of the beige speech that you referred to at the beginning. Um, so thank you very much for giving a Technicolor speech. Um, and Wonderful. also for just giving us, setting us that challenge, that very high-minded challenge um, that is not easy and, and will take a lot of the hard work and courage that, that we've all talked about. But um, as you say, if, we, if it's not expressed, then we're, we're never going to get there. So um, very grateful to you for your speech and for kicking off the conference in, in such a great, inspiring way. Thank you. Thanks.